All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, this room, by the way, is fantastically large. Uh, it just keeps going and going. Hi, back there. Um, so, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming uh, to the last session of the day. Um, it's nice to see so many of you here. Um, it is the last session of the day, isn't it? No, there's another one. It's my last session of the day. How's that? My last session of the day. So th thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Edge. I'm with uh, Microsoft. Uh, I'm presently an Office 365 technical specialist at Microsoft, uh, but my background at Microsoft previous to this has all been in the realm of web content management uh, for the last 11 years, ever since we acquired Encompass Labs back in 2001. Uh, and I'm here to talk a little bit about, or actually a lot about, planning for the life cycle of your SharePoint 2013 website. This is a repeat presentation of a session that we delivered at last year's SharePoint conference. The big difference between what we talked about last year and what we're talking about this year is a lot, because there are a lot of capabilities in the realm of internet sites that we've added into SharePoint 2013. This is a business-focused session, so I'm not going to be coding. I'm not going to be talking about architecture, except information architecture. We're going to be talking about the fundamental ways that you go about planning uh, to produce a website on top of SharePoint 2013 and to produce one that has lasting power. So a couple of... Uh, of quick slides before we get going. Uh, this is an example of, of, of a website, right? It's not an example of a website. It's a restroom. It's a restroom out in the woods. Um, it's very basic. It's got a, a sink there in the front with a well pump to it. Very basic facilities inside. It's the kind of place that you only want to go to if you absolutely must. If that's the, the only option that you have. And once you go there, you never want to go back again, right? You don't want your website to be like this bathroom, right? You want people that visit your website to have a consistent experience, right? And you want them to want to return to your website. This is a restroom that I can get behind. It's clean, it's well lit, it's well signed, and it's the kind of place that I might want to go back to. And that's what this session is all about, is how do you deliver a website and deliver an experience that makes people want to come back? And how do you plan for that experience before you even begin to write a single line of code what are the steps, the fundamental steps that you need to take to get there? It's not a deep dive on branding because there are a lot of branding sessions at the SharePoint conference. We're going to talk about branding, but we're going to talk about branding as a concept and as a function of proper design of your information architecture. So the goal of this session is to introduce you to some methods that you can use to take your standard vanilla SharePoint 2013 site that looks like this and maybe make it look like this. How do we design a compelling experience? How do we get eyeballs on our site? And how do we get people to come back? How do we engage with our users? How do we deliver content in multiple languages? How do we deliver content to multiple devices, creating it and designing it once? Or maybe take a site in SharePoint and make it look like this. And these are all examples of production SharePoint sites. How do we design a compelling experience? Or make it look like this, or this, or any of these sites? How do we design? How do we take our concepts and make them real inside of SharePoint? OK? There are thousands of sites up on the internet today that run on SharePoint. They've all been developed over time, right? There's some that have probably been up there for five or six years by this point, um, and they probably haven't been updated since then. That's not what you want to do. You want to design and you want to plan from the beginning to have continuous updates. And let's talk about how we get there. First of all, what this session is, it's a roadmap for building a website on SharePoint. It's freshly updated for SharePoint 2013. I've got what I think are some pretty cool demos to show you as well, including something that I'm pretty sure none of you have ever seen before. Um, it is not, as I said, a detailed code-packed session where I'm going to stand up here and write master pages for you from scratch, because nobody wants to do that. The topics that we'll discuss, we'll talk about the, uh, the website project planning. We'll talk about the people that you need to have involved in the process before you even begin the process of, of, of building a website. Who do you need to get engaged? What do their skills need to be? What do they need to be capable of doing? We'll talk about the design roadmap and then how you actually build a SharePoint website. What are the steps that I need to take to deliver on all the things that people expect to see on a website? And we'll cover all these topics. None, not technical, and actually by the time we get to the end, we may step it up a little bit on the technical content, but for the most part, level 100 stuff. All right, so let's get going. Whenever you look at, at, at planning a website, 
in SharePoint, you want to launch a new, a new website in general, and not necessarily just on SharePoint, there are some core metrics that you expect to receive or that you expect to see in your website. One of them is an increase in the number of visitors, obviously, right? Another one is an increase in page views per session. I want to make my site sticky. I want to make sure that people stay and that they're not leaving. We call this the bounce rate, right? How many of my users actually stayed on my site and did what I expected them to do, or how many of them abandoned uh, the experience and abandoned the path that I hoped they would take halfway through? That's bad. We want to improve that. We want to in increase time on site, of course, and not idle time on site. We want to increase active time on site, because just because you're sitting on my, my site for an hour doesn't mean you're sitting there looking at the page. You've probably tabbed over into another tab. And this is the most important one, though. This is the only metric that you can really effectively measure and look at to get a return on investment, and that's conversion rate. Conversion rate is different for every organization. If you're selling something on the web, you're selling a tangible good, then the checkout operation is the conversion because I've turned you from a looky-loo who's just there looking at my stuff into someone who's actually purchased something and I've converted you into a sale. If you're not selling something on your website, if you're just selling information, then conversion rate may be a little tenuous, may be hard to pick, it may be hard to get to. Uh, if you're a medical facility and you're delivering information out on the web, conversion for you may be simply someone finding a doctor that's a specialist in the, uh, the field that you're looking for and being able to connect to that person. And whenever they find the doctor's page, being able to click on a button that launches a Skype call as an example, that may be a conversion to you. Conversion depends on your industry and conversion depends on what you're trying to achieve. But it is the single most important, in my opinion, metric that you can define is how do I convert? And then also sentiment on social media. But sentiment on social media should be used as a tool to drive more conversions. Conversion is the single most important uh, metric. And I'm going to talk about social media uh, in a bit. I'm going to show you a new uh, Facebook integration that we have in SharePoint 2013 on how we can very easily add face uh, Facebook social uh, sentiment directly into the site with comments, with likes, with sending, uh, et cetera. So when we look at the project lifecycle, we don't want to be on the left side of this slide. We want to be on the right side of this slide. Because the left side leads to those sites that were launched in SharePoint in 2006 and haven't been updated yet. Because they planned, they gathered requirements, maybe. They designed a site, they built it, and then it's just been sitting there. Maybe they're continuing to update the content, but by this point, six years later, it feels stale. It doesn't feel fresh anymore. So instead of having a very serial process where I go through these steps, you really need to focus on the right-hand side, gathering requirements, creating your site, uh, designing your site, building your site, and then taking user feedback into consideration and planning and designing your process in such a way that it's easy to capture that user feedback. If you were in this room in the last session, I think the number nine uh, uh, key or secret to user adoption was getting user feedback. Getting user feedback is extremely easy to do internally because people will tell you and it's easy to connect. People are sometimes hesitant to give you their opinion on, on your website. Using things like Facebook integration gives you a great opportunity to keep your, your finger on the pulse of what people are saying about your content, whether it's resonating with them, and it's a great way to get instant user feedback and take that feedback and build it into the requirements for the next iteration of your site. So when we look at building out uh, a website on top of SharePoint, it is a little bit different than building out just a standard old website like you've probably built before. Uh, and the reason being is that there are a couple of additional technical people that you need to have in the mix. But you also need to have all the other people that you'd normally use in any web project. You need a UI designer. You need a usability specialist. You need to do some studies around how your target demographic expects to consume your information because it's probably not in the way that you think they're going to do it. So it's nice to have a usability expert. You need a project manager, you need a business analyst, you need a content strategist, someone that understands your business and understands what you're trying to achieve and what you're trying to deploy and that can work in tandem with all these other folks on the right-hand side to deliver appropriate requirements. Now, this doesn't mean, I'm not saying that every project needs to have, you know, 11 different specialists, but you can have people that have cross-functions, right? So you may have three people and they, they work across functions and oftentimes 
your UI designer and your graphics designer may be the same person, and they certainly could be the same person. And so the right-hand side of this are, are things that you need to do when you think about launching any website. The SharePoint-specific stuff lives on the left-hand side. Uh, you need a web developer, and you need a web developer that's up to speed on the latest web development techniques. They need to pre be proficient with JavaScript. They need to be proficient with jQuery. They need to understand RESTful data. They need to understand OAuth and OData. They need to be able to, to code against our brand new client-side object model in SharePoint. You may need a SharePoint developer as well, although that SharePoint developer could be running double duty as being a professional web developer. Maybe they've been tooling themselves up on these new techniques. So you very well may be able to have cross functions in the web developer and the SharePoint developer route. You also need an infrastructure specialist because somebody has to deliver the architecture for you. Now this is becoming less and less true, starting to become less and less true as we look at things like Windows Azure IaaS and the ability to deploy SharePoint for internet sites out into Windows Azure as a virtual machine where we don't necessarily have to worry about the underlying infrastructure. Uh, we do still need to maintain the virtual machines and keep them patched and whatnot, but the infrastructure specialist role is, is, is increasingly becoming less important than the web developer role. And then, of course, there's the business sponsor, who's the most important person, right? So when we go to build a SharePoint 2013 website, I look at three things. I look at the site user experience, the branding, and the information architecture, plus the infrastructure, depending on how you want to deploy it, uh, and then the content and workflows. And, and I separate these things into three discrete blocks because I really fundamentally think that they are separate issues to be tackled independent of one another. Content and workflows can't happen without information architecture, and you need to start here first. This is where you start. This is your first task. Your second task is in the middle, and your third task is on the right. And when you put all these together, you end up with a SharePoint website. So whenever we look at the actual process of planning for your design, uh, we'll start at the top. You design your information architecture. This is critical. If you don't nail your information architecture at the beginning, at the outset, you're going to fail. Your website's not going to be any good at all, just period. And it's also very difficult after the build to go back and completely redo your information architecture because you've based your navigation, you've based all of your content delivery constructs, everything is based on this underlying IA or this underlying information architecture. And it's extremely important that you do it first. I'm gonna show you an example of a fantastic information architecture in just a minute uh, that was designed by one of our partners for another customer. Um, once you have your information architecture and you've designed what is the content, what am I trying to deliver and how is it going to be organized logically, then and only then can you begin the process of building out wireframes or a very rough sketch of what my site is going to look like. And after you deliver the wireframes, there is an opportunity and actually a, a necessity to have a tech review. You need to sit down and, 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 and look at it and say, will what I'm trying to build actually be feasible to build in the technology platform that I've chosen? Is it going to be too difficult? Is it going to be simple? If it's simple, can we modify the design and add more bells and whistles in it? Are we going to be able to deliver this in the amount of time that we need to be able to deliver it? And the tech review and the tech check there is extremely important. Then you get into the design comps or the design compositions. We take our initial sketch and we deliver a, an outline using real images. And then we have another tech review. Can we do this? Is this possible? Is it feasible? And then finally, you end up with a functional prototype. And I'm going to show you some tools that we use typically uh, whenever we go through this. And throughout the session in the bottom right, uh, I've put details uh, to other sessions that you can go and check out that uh, drill down deeper into these topics because I have to gloss over everything in order to get through the whole process. So if you want to learn more about this process, go and check out that session, SPC 019. This is an example of an information architecture and I realize it's kind of like an eye chart. Uh, probably difficult for you to read if you're not sitting right by a screen. Um, but this is an example of an information architecture for a company that is selling a product. And they essentially have designed from the outset a content map. This is what every single page that talks about a product that we sell, this is a layout of all the content that we're going to deliver. And then we take that layout and we derive our metadata from this layout. We know that we're going to have a product. We know that every product has a color. We know that uh, 
that every product has previously been published in a couple of different years. And we can tag all this stuff and establish our metadata and establish our navigation based on this design. We even go down in, into a depth where we say, this is the first level content, this is the second level, this is the third level, the fourth level. And if we have a really well-structured information architecture in a printout like this, it becomes very easy to take that and build navigational structures on top of it. And whenever I get into the search-based content publishing model towards the end, you're going to realize that if you don't have this, you can't build a navigation in SharePoint anymore because we're fundamentally changing the way that navigation is delivered. We're not basing our navigation off of, a, off of a, a pages library structure anymore. We're basing it off of the metadata that's associated and derived from your information architecture. So if you don't have this nailed first, you will fail because there's no way that you can build your website if you don't have an information architecture from which to derive the structure. Sorry, my clicker is a little hard to use. So we talked about information architecture. We talked about the team. Let's get into uh, branding. Yeah. I thought the navigation based off of search and metadata was an option. It is, yeah. So, so the question is, Jeffrey, I, I thought that navigation and metadata, uh, or navigation based off of metadata using the search engine is an option. It absolutely is. So yes, you're right. That, that is. You absolutely can still use folder structures, absolutely. But your folder structures still need to, to adhere to the information architecture that you've designed. Thank you. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. It is an option. And, and whenever I talk about building uh, websites on 2013, I like to highlight the new features. Yeah. And there are reasons why you may not want to do it as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, precisely, yeah. So let's talk about branding. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on branding because we have the world's foremost renowned experts on branding. SharePoint here at this conference doing branding sessions. Uh, and in fact, I've stolen a few of their screenshots to go through this. But I wanted to go through a couple of screenshots of sites. And wh why do I go through this? Because branding is, is individual, right, to the organization. If you are a public uh, sector account, right, if you're a public sector customer and you're delivering information to citizens, you need to deliver the information quickly to them. But branding may not be the most important thing to you. It may be that the content is much more important than the look and feel to you. And so you have options. There are different flavors of branding. Then you have moderate complexity sites. You know, when you talk about building websites, sometimes you, you build websites for your customers. Sometimes you build websites for your employees to access externally. Your employees are more willing to accept lesser brand in your sites than your customers are. And we support all of them inside of SharePoint. And then you have the fully custom look and feel. Uh, and then all these sites that I just showed are, of course, examples of live sites that are up and running on SharePoint today. So let's talk about how we get to branding. I talked about the design process. We start with information architecture, and then we get into wireframes. Here's an example of a wireframe designed in Visio. We've just stenciled out and sketched out, and, and I did indeed steal this from, uh, from Randy Driscoll. Um, and this is an example of, of a wireframe being built out inside of Visio. Visio has tools that allow you to do very easy wireframe building. Once you get past wireframes, you want to move into an area where you can take your concepts and begin to vet them out against your usability experts and maybe against you know, one of your customers, maybe against you know, some other people in the organization. And Microsoft has a variety of tools that most people have never heard of to help you do this. And they live inside of the expression tool set. So we have an application and expression called Expression Blend. Uh, there's Expression Web Designer, and then we also have Expression Sketchflow. And what Sketchflow lets you do is tie all these wireframes together and create an iterative process where you can begin to map out your wireframes and then solicit feedback from your team members and build a collaborative scenario in the browser, right? So we put our wireframes up. We begin to make it real. It's kind of like a back of the napkin drawing, only it's in the browser. And then we can come in and annotate it. And we can create a, a discussion around this design. Does this design make sense, Jeffrey? Well, yeah, it kind of does. But where's our pause button? And why don't we have arrows on the right-hand side? And I can provide that feedback to the design team. And then we also have the ability within Sketch, within Expression Blend, to provide commenting capabilities. So I say, hey, I want you to go back and modify this look and feel, and you make the modifications. And then I come in and say, this looks great, but why don't you move this here? And we can work together between the designers and the, uh, the, the planners or the information architects can work together 
to deliver this. And then eventually you end up with the design comp, which is basically just a screenshot or an idea of what you think the final product may look like. And then we take that design comp, we chop it up, we create all the images, we pull them out, and we create a functional prototype inside of SharePoint. Uh, getting to this point has become a lot easier in SharePoint 2013 because we now don't have to open up SharePoint Designer. We don't have to kind of force feed our design into SharePoint. We don't kind of have to move all the SharePoint stuff into the right place. We now can take our design out of whatever design tool we're using and bring it directly into SharePoint using the design manager, which I think everyone saw during the keynote. But there are a number of tools that are available for Microsoft to help you through this process that we usually use uh, whenever we go through uh, the process of building a SharePoint 2013 website. Now, I put these up here just so that you're aware of what they are, but the most important thing, as I mentioned, is that you can bring your own design tool. If you want to use Dreamweaver, fine, do it, bring it. Uh, bring me your HTML, bring me your JavaScript, bring me your CSS, and we'll just import it all in using the design manager. Has everybody seen a demo of this so far? I, I, I know they showed it in the keynote, but I, I think there probably were a couple of sessions that dive deeply into this. This fundamentally changes and, and, and increases uh, your ability to deliver websites in a much shorter amount of time uh, by virtue of being able to just bring your designs and put them directly into the design manager. So moving out of branding and moving out of information architecture, let's talk a little bit about, about how to get your users engaged. And we talk about social media, and, and there are really two facets to social media strategy, in my opinion. You have social media integration, which simply means bringing social into my site. And then we have social design, which incorporates functions of social integration but it's fundamentally different. I'm going to show you some cool examples. So when we talk about social integration, the big one is Facebook, right? Because everyone's on Facebook. Uh, everyone uses Facebook. So getting Facebook into your site gives you a way to connect with the most used web application in the world, right? And it's just as simple as putting a like button on your site. That can give you instant feedback about what your users and what the consumers of your information are thinking about. That's valuable information that allows you to refine your strategy moving forward. If you put a comment box on there, that gives you an even better opportunity to connect with your, with your, uh, with your consumers. Because it not only gives you insight into what they're thinking about your content, but it also lets you see who these people are. You can identify who's actually using your site. And it's interesting because my local newspaper, uh, I live in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, my local newspaper, the Winston-Salem Journal, has put Facebook integration in, into the newspaper website. Um, and it's very interesting to go in and read the comments and then look and, and click through and see who these people are that are commenting. And, and it's got to be really useful information for the newspaper to really find out who's their demographic. Are they targeting the people that they think they should be targeting? And it's very easy to get this information by integrating with Facebook. And people are willing to do it. It's great. So uh, Facebook integration can be done in two ways. What I call the hard way, which involves you going to Facebook's developer portal, you get the Facebook generated HTML and JavaScript, you drop it into your page, and then you have to go and drop it into every single page, or you drop it into your templates, and it becomes part of uh, your design. This is the hard way. This is the way that you used to have to do it. I want to show you a new way of doing it, and that's built on top of the app model. So this is a SharePoint 2013 website. I am running it in Office 365. Um, you do have a public website option inside of Office 365. It's not nearly as feature rich yet as, uh, as running SharePoint uh, on premises for your internet site. Uh, but this is your, your basic site template uh, for a website in Office 365 for a public facing website. And this is a live site. If you've got your computer open, you can go to gedge-public.sharepoint.com and you can pull this up. I don't know why you'd want to, but you could, just so you can see that there's no smoke and mirrors here. So what I'm going to do is go into the page, and I'm going to begin editing it. And what I want to do is actually add some Facebook integration into the page. So as I said, it's a very simple concept. Now, the hard way would require me to go to the Facebook developer portal, grab their code, understand their code, go in and modify it and tweak it, and drop it onto the page. It sounds easy, but it's not, especially not if, if I'm not a developer. 
it becomes much more difficult for me to do that. So what we've tried to do uh, out of the box here, uh, or out of the service as it were, with Office 365, since there really is no box, um, is we've added Facebook integration as an app option inside of the SharePoint store. So we can go into the SharePoint store and add social integration directly from SharePoint. So what I'm going to do is go in and click Insert Social Plugins, and I'm redirected to the SharePoint store. Now let's stop and pause here, because the SharePoint store represents an incredible opportunity for you to go out and grab applications that other people have, bu have built, have already created, and have published in the store, and drag and drop this functionality into your website. This may increase your time to market. This may make it easier for you to deliver certain features if you don't have to go out and develop it. Now, there's not a whole lot of stuff in the SharePoint store yet because, well, it hasn't launched officially. It's still in preview. But eventually, there will be many apps inside of here that you can add into your site. Why reinvent the wheel? Why not just go out and grab something that's been developed by a trusted partner? And the process of adding these things into the site is extremely easy. So what I'm going to do is just click on the Facebook integration app. And may, may the demo gods be with me today. Uh, we've had some connectivity issues over the past couple of days. Uh, and I'm going to go to the Facebook integration app. This is something that we provide for Microsoft. And I'll just click Add It. And so this is going to add this app to my SharePoint site and bring it directly into my page. So I've already purchased it, quote unquote purchased it. It's a free app, but I've purchased it before, I've used it before, uh, and it's adding into my site. And you can see it there in the middle, Facebook social integration, the app is being added. It should be done now. Just refresh and see. It is. And so now I need to go in and configure the app. And I just click on it and it will load up the application configuration screen. Now this is something that every app will probably come with, some way for you to configure the way that the app behaves inside of SharePoint, and I'm just going to enable it. Now I'm also going to go and sign into Facebook. There we go. There's me. Uh, and a trip of my visit to Disney World with my kids about a month ago. So I'm logged into Facebook, right? And uh, what I want to do is actually go back into the website now that the Facebook integration has been added in and add a web part to the site. So you can see that I've enabled the app. There are a lot of, of options here. Uh, which social plugin templates do I want to use? Do I want to use like button? Do I want to use send button? Which ones of these do I want to make available? I can also modify the app to configure page property mappings. Now, why is this interesting? Well, if we've designed our information architecture, and we've added all that stuff into the metadata store, guess what? All of that stuff becomes available for me to send to Facebook so that whenever the Facebook integration launches on the page, it knows things about my page. I'm able to provide those metadata attributes to the Facebook app so that the Facebook app knows what this page is about and is able to target content to the users using Facebook profile properties. Very interesting possibilities here, okay? So let's get back and just add this in really quickly. So now whenever I go back and choose insert web part, I actually need to refresh. And I go into insert web part. I now have social plugins over on the left hand side. And if I want to add the like button, I click Facebook like button. And my place to add it does not seem to be there. Hang on one second. There we go. Sorry, let me try that again. There we go. And so now I've got a Facebook like button that's been added directly to the page. I also can do things like add Facebook comments, add a comment box into the page. And this all works, right? Immediately, I'll save it and publish it. And now I'll go to the page. And I think it's cached. Uh, or it didn't save. Try this one more time. And then it works, right? So I can like it. I can also take this and send this page through Facebook. 
So maybe I want to send this, and I just want to show you that it is real and it actually works. Maybe I want to send this to, I don't know, my mother-in-law. So this is an example of, uh, of social integration, right? Integrating with Facebook in a very simple way. And I can take this and add it directly to all of my page templates, right? So that it's part of every page in a certain spot. And there are a number of different web parts. So that's one example of social integration. I want to talk about taking social integration a step further as well. Uh, and right now we offer that Facebook uh, app. You can expect to see more coming. Let's talk about uh, social design and, and how social design is different but builds on the social integration. Uh, social design is all about designing your site to be social by nature and make the entire experience social. And I use TripAdvisor as an example here because TripAdvisor is a great website that's made social part of the experience. And in fact, when you go to TripAdvisor the first time, it pops up and helpfully tells me that travel is better with friends. Log in and let's see what your friends are up to. So I click the login button and I connect with Facebook. It shows me what my friends, my Facebook friends have been up to, right? So it shows me where they've been, what they've recommended that you go do, all of their reviews, all this stuff that's in there. And then it presents me with the map and I can click into the map and the map is really interesting because there are a lot of people in the SharePoint community that I'm friends with on Facebook that travel a lot and have a lot of insights. There also are personal friends of mine that travel a lot. And so this is Joel Olson's map on TripAdvisor. And so Joel Olson's map pulls up, and maybe I'm planning a trip to Africa. Maybe I'm going to go see Kilimanjaro. And I notice that Kilimanjaro and, 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 and that part of, of Africa is one of Joel's favorite places. And I click on, on the place, Livingstone, Zambia. Three of my friends have been there. I didn't know that. I didn't know that until I went to, to TripAdvisor and saw it. And so now I'm able to connect with these people outside of the context of the TripAdvisor website to ask for recommendations. And then the ultimate goal of social design, though, is to get people to your content, but to get people to your content in a different way and do it socially. And now I know as I'm reading about these beautiful waterfalls and I'm seeing the content that's being provided by TripAdvisor, I know that my friends have been there as well and I can ask them for ideas. This is social design. It includes all the integration, but it takes it a step further, and it builds it directly into uh, the core navigation of the, of the experience and the way that the content is presented. So very easy to achieve in SharePoint 2013, and certainly something to think about whenever you're thinking about uh, designing your website. So let's get into another topic. What's your mobile strategy? You gotta have one, right? The, the question used to be that, that I would ask three years ago whenever I talk about SharePoint for internet sites, it's do you have a mobile strategy? And now it's you have to have a mobile strategy. You have to have some kind of thinking in place around mobility. And I wanna show you a couple of examples. Uh, this is what a mobile strategy looks like. It's a strategy for delivering content to every type of device and delivering a consistent look and feel across all of the devices. And so the city of Calgary has done a really good job of this. They've got experiences that are designed for various uh, form factors, uh, for various size browsers. And I'll show you another example of, uh, of, of this kind of responsive design approach uh, in just a few minutes. But this is an example of a website that's been designed in SharePoint that uses responsive design techniques to dynamically adapt to the device that's accessing the page without having to create specialized experiences for each device. And I want to show you a demo of another site, live site that does this really well. And so this is the Danish Transport Authority. Uh, and the Danish Transport Authority gives you the ability, I have no idea what this says, I do have some of my friends from Denmark here in the front row, that could, that could maybe help me out if we really want to know what it says. Um, but I can look up license plate numbers. So what did I do whenever I found this site? Well, I went to Bing and I found a search for Danish license plates and I found one that actually works. So I'll enter in a license plate number and it'll pull up registration information about that license plate. So it's an Audi Q7. It looks like uh, it passed inspection uh, back in December of last year. So this is a SharePoint website built on SharePoint. The reason why I'm showing it to you though is this. Watch what happens as I change the size of the page. I'm going to drop it down and we're going to mimic like the size or the resolution of an iPad for instance. Notice what happens to the design instantly. It instantly flips over into something that's appropriate for an iPad. The space is spaced out. It becomes very touch friendly. And this is a function of the design. And watch what happens whenever I shrink it down to the size of a telephone. 
it instantly adapts to become a mobile app. This is very cool stuff, right? You should be delivering these, these experiences, and this is what you should be thinking about when you think about your mobile strategy. And there are a couple of schools of thought here, okay? Some of the schools of thought focus on delivering native app experiences, which is great if you know what kind of, of, of devices people are gonna come with, right? So if you know that people are gonna be coming using a Windows phone, you can design a native app experience for the Windows phone, and that's the example in the middle there. If you don't know what device they're using, you have to cast a, a wide, you know, a wide-reaching net to kind of go after all of them and go after them based on form factor size. All of these are options in SharePoint 2013. There's a lot of new capabilities around mobile channels uh, in SharePoint in the publishing engine, the ability to create a channel for smartphones, the ability to create a channel for smaller screen-sized tablets, create your content once, and then have it rendered appropriately. Or you could take the, the straight-up design approach that I just showed and said, you know what, I'm just going to make one design and we're going to make it responsive and adaptive. It's your choice. You have choice in, in how you deliver it. We can support any of them uh, using SharePoint. For more details on this, uh, there's a good session, SPC 255, uh, that you can go take a look at. So the next area is planning for your content. Now, we already talked about information architecture, right? And we, we talked about designing an information architecture and, and delivering an information architecture. But once you've designed and delivered your IA, now you've got to get content into the system. You've got to get content into the system that ascribes to that information architecture that you have already designed. And when we're looking at SharePoint 2013, you've got a lot of new choices. There are a lot of new capabilities that have been added into the platform around web content management, and these are just a few of them. So you need to plan to support these things, because these things are going to make your life a lot easier when you're going through and designing and delivering and building out your content. Now, I'm not going to walk you through the steps of adding content into SharePoint, because if you're here at the SharePoint conference, you've probably done that already. So that's kind of a no-brainer. Instead, I want to talk about how the new publishing model fundamentally changes the way that we deliver content and builds on all these other capabilities. And we'll talk about things like cross-site publishing, uh, targeting panels, search-driven sites, content search web parts. Now, although all these new capabilities are available and you should use them, this doesn't mean that you can't continue to do it the way that you've always done it in SharePoint before because all the old publishing features, they're still there. You can still do it the same old way that you've always done it. But whenever you're planning to build a new site, if you're going to be rebuilding the site anyway, why not make uh, use of all these new features, okay? So let's flip through and talk just a little bit about the search-driven publishing model. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time diving into it because, again, there's a great session that you can go to that talks about nothing but this. But the search-driven publishing model fundamentally changes the way that we deliver content. And when I talked about the information architecture being incredibly important to delivering a compelling, uh, compelling experience, there's a reason for that. And that's because whenever we publish content uh, in SharePoint 2013 and we make use of this new search-based uh, uh, content publishing model, it's all based on metadata. And so if you've designed your information architecture really well from the beginning, then we can actually derive our navigation, we can derive all the ways that our content is published based on that initial investment in IA. Okay, so we can take all these things, the navigation term set, the tagging term set, combine them all together and use them to drive the way that content is delivered using search. So search indexes all this stuff. It's all filterable. It's all refinable, right? We're just delivering search, but we're delivering search in a different way. We're using search to create the end user experience. So it's search results in a way that, that, that doesn't look and feel like search. So we take all this stuff, we index it, we put it inside of the search index, there we go. And then we begin the process of publishing it out. We build query rules. We have the ability to do content recommendations. We recommend that you go and take a look at this item because you're looking at this item here. What's the, what's the relationship between items and how do we do recommendations? Recommendations is something that we support. And we also have the ability to, to publish this content out. So we take the same piece of content and we publish it out to many different pages. We publish it out to many different form factors. We can even take the content and publish it out to a non-SharePoint site. You can consume this stuff completely outside of SharePoint using RESTful interfaces. So it really helps you kind of expand your horizons in terms of, of planning for your website because your website doesn't even have to be SharePoint on the front end anymore. Right? Your website could be an ASP.NET MVC app and you're just consuming the SharePoint content 
in your MVC app on the front end using SharePoint search uh, APIs, using the RESTful APIs. So the, the design process changes fundamentally with 2013. Uh, with the new options for publishing out content, because we now can take that content and just slightly modify the query that we're issuing to fast search and have a completely different set of content that's pulled out and published to multiple sites out of that one common central corpus of content. We also have the ability to, uh, to effectively do translations using the same model. We create content once. We have new uh, integrated translation services. It's machine-based translation, right? But it gets you 50% of the way there. You still need to have a human eye go over it and, and, cre and, and correct it. But it's easier to translate something that's already half of the way translated there for the most part. Uh, and the translation machine, machine translation tools have gotten a lot better. I actually didn't need my, my friends from Denmark's help to translate the Danish page because I ran it through a translator and I understood what it was. Um, sorry, guys. Maybe later. Um, and I have the ability to publish content to multiple, to multiple places from the same source. This is a really cool thing to think about as well, is that targeted content can be everywhere. The recommendations engine and the fact that we're driving recommendations based on search gives me the opportunity to look at who my user is, look at what they're doing on the site, look at what they're looking at currently, and making recommendations of other things to look at. You tie this back to social integration, and I showed you those metadata tags where I could take and provide page, uh, page fields off of the page to Facebook. You can really build some interesting scenarios with targeted content. Uh, we can look at the Facebook user's profile as an example uh, once they've connected with Facebook, and we can see that they work at Microsoft, and we can deliver targeted content to them based on what we know about them. We can look at Facebook and say, this person is 44 years old. My 44-year-old demographic, if I'm a hospital, there are certain medical procedures that I might want to target to them, that I might want to recommend to them. So you have the ability to build a, a personalized dynamic experience. And these are all things that you need to think about when you're going through the planning process. Because it's very hard to implement this if you don't nail the first steps, if you don't nail the information architecture. So let's talk about analytics. SharePoint does provide some analytics out of the box, and they've gotten better in 2013. Um, we still look at using uh, third-party analytics tools because let's face it, SharePoint is a content publishing system. Uh, SharePoint is a collaboration platform. It's a web publishing engine. It's not an analytics tool. Okay? We do have some analytics that are improved, but the analytics help us drive the experience, not necessarily help us understand things about our users. So we have a couple of partners that we recommend. Um, Web Trends is one of them, and, and these two partners that I'm, that I'm talking about here, uh, they're both in the expo hall. So if you're interested in this topic, I'd recommend that you go by and, and take a look. Web Trends is interesting because it's very graphical. It gives me deep insight into what's happening on my site, and they'll be delivering a version of it out of the SharePoint store, which makes it easy to integrate. You take something like Google uh, Analytics as an example. You want to implement Google Analytics, you've got to physically go in and drop that JavaScript on the page. If you're building a site in SharePoint, the new app model allows us to just go to the app store, the SharePoint store, click Add It, and we can add the analytics to the page transparently. It doesn't require a developer to do it. A developer doesn't have to maintain it long term. And so WebTrends will be delivering an app uh, as part of the SharePoint store to give very rich, uh, very graphical analytics on top of what's happening inside of your site. We also have another partner that delivers some pretty interesting tools uh, on top of, uh, of SharePoint, and it's a, a company called Entlock. And Entlock provides a marketing suite for SharePoint. So these are tools that marketers can use uh, to gain deep insight into what's happening. It's not just what's happening on my website, it's what's not happening. Are people following the click paths that I expect them to? We create content funnels or we create funnels of traffic and we say, out of all these people that come in, I want to send half of them over here and send half of them over here and let's see what they do differently based on where I send them. So A-B, multivariate testing, uh, doing behavioral targeting of content. You've clicked here, you've clicked there, and based on the fact that you've clicked these two things, we're going to show something you know, fancy over here to attract your attention to what it is that we're selling. And so these add-on tools will all be delivered as apps in the marketplace. And, and this gives you a, a fundamental difference in, 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 in designing for, uh, for SharePoint 2013 because the App Store makes it easier to add these components in in a much uh, lighter weight way and improves the experience. 
So the point of this session today was to kind of walk you through a set of, of, of repeatable steps uh, that you can take uh, and, and that you can follow to deliver a new website on top of SharePoint 2013. And I actually finished way early, which is surprising. Um, so in summary, I, I think the number one thing to talk about here and, and to make note of is don't be overwhelmed, right? I've shown you a lot of stuff. You don't have to use it. Use what you need. Take the things that I've shown you, make them fit in your organization and use them. And a good example is like, like what we were talking about there with the navigation being search driven. That might not work for you. You might need to do it the old way. There might be a valid business reason. So just because I've introduced a topic doesn't mean that you have to do it that way. You can continue to do things uh, the old way if you want. And you don't need to use all these things. But I wanted to, to bring out some new ideas and show you some new capabilities and, and help you think about how you can implement them. I hope that you can use the content of the session as a blueprint uh, to help you define your own design and help you define your own process for delivering a website on top of SharePoint 2013. And then most importantly, consider phased approaches. Bring in that feedback loop. Bring in the social integration. Solicit your users for feedback and create a content use life cycle. And that content use life cycle and that feedback life cycle will help you deliver fresh content to your end users. And that's it. Thank you guys very much for your attendance. I will be up here to answer questions uh, and come on up. Thank you.